Hi everyone, it's Tony Tom Logan back with another video for you and today we're going to be taking a look at the Gigabyte Aorus TRX40 Extreme. Now uh, I'm quite excited about this because the X570 Extreme was rather good, if not one of the best uh, X570 boards that are out there for extreme use because of the VRMs. And they've uh, taken that kind of ethos with the uh, TRX40 Extreme and cranked it up a notch as well. So the design looks good and everything looks great on paper, but it's going to be great to finally see how it um, performs. Now I have tested it with a 3960X because uh, for NDA I didn't get a chance to get my hands on a 3970X. But stay tuned because you're going to be able to compare it to the uh, Zenith and the Creator as well in these graphs. And if and when I do get a 70, I'll even come back and do another video. But you'll be able to see the difference between the three boards with the same processor anyway, so it's not really going to matter the odds. But anyway, strap yourself in, go and get yourself a cup of tea, maybe some biscuits or some cookies, depending on what side of the Atlantic you are, and get comfy. <laughs> Okay, now I have done a full preview on this board, which is on the channel and on the website already. So if you want a properly like in-depth look around everything you can do, I'm just going to skim across the main bits here because I'm assuming that you're just going to really be here about the performance. Now, the main thing with this board is up here and that is the VRMs. And the VRMs have now been uh, the uh, X570 version were Infineon, but they were 60 amp. These have now been cranked up to 70 amp. It's 16 individual phases with a 16 phase PWM controller as well. No doublers, no parallel wiring, just 16 unadulterated 70 amp phases with a 16 phase controller. So it's that, like I said, they've turned it up to max. Um, so they've gone to awful lengths to make sure that you're going to be able to have enough power for the CPU. Also, over there, the two 8 pins, those two 8 pins are shielded, but the little pins inside, they're actually solid as well. And normally they're like little folded round ones and they're hollow, but they've gone full um, solid with those. And then when we look down here, the 24 pin is the same story. They've literally gone to great lengths to make sure everything is going to be bomb proof. Now with the design of the board, I'm keep moving everything around, but with the design of the board, you can see that we have a lot of right angled connectors down the side. At the top, there are the uh, PWM fan headers, and you can see that there are five of them there that you can uh, use, and they are pretty much all up there as well. The rest of the board is fairly light, for PWM headers, I must admit, and they are all up there, but it's one of the best things that I can say is if you need more, then just use PWM splitters. I use them in pretty much every build that we do here and I've never encountered any problems. Now there are a couple of little headers here. So you've got one here and then one here. One of those is for the front panel headers and the wires all go off to the side, and the other one is for the USB. The one thing I will say about the front panel headers is that, oh sorry, the USB header, is you can see the colour of the cables on the end, and I think that should have had some heat shrink or something over it, or just been black, because I don't particularly like the look of the condiment cables. And once it's folded round to go round to the back of the board, it just makes it that even more bit visible. And I, if I'm completely honest, even at this early stage, that's probably the worst part about this entire board in the performance, the design, the whole thing is that one cable. So please, Gigabyte, can you please sort that for a later board or something? Because it's the only thing. Uh, when we come further down, I need to move the lighting around so that you can get a slightly better look, but lots and lots and lots of satas down the sides. You get two, four, six, eight, ten in total. And then just underneath those, still with a right angle, you've got your two USB 3 external headers for like your case and that sort of thing. And this six pin uh, PWM, PWM, what are you want about Tom? PCR Express header at the bottom. 
you don't have to connect to that that's literally just for if you've got an, a full stack of like pcr express cards or render cards or whatever and you might need a little bit more power putting into the board but very very few people are ever actually going to need that or even see any benefit from it if you do connect it moving around even more now you can see as i'll zoom in you've got um some uh multimeter headers here so you can take uh, voltage measurements couple of switches going on front panel audio and all that sort of stuff down in the bottom corner you also do get some rgb up here i've just noticed that i do need to say this just quickly because i was a little bit wrong you have a look there are two cpu headers up there so you get another couple of fan headers i'm not seeing anywhere else on the board though now uh, what you do need to realize is and i've said this in the cpu review but the new trx40 the chipset and everything it's not backwards compatible so you can only use this at the moment with the 3960x or the 3970x and when it does come out the 3990x although that's still rumored but we pretty much know it's coming so you can't use it with first or second generation threadripper it's just not possible and the differences between them really are as we have a lot lot more pcr express laid out on the board there's an oh, awful lot of pcr express with the cpus and everything all being laid out but um it, it is the pcr express 4 that has caused the socket change and then obviously because of all of the extra um uh, bandwidth with the pcr express lanes that's why we have a socket change and why things are just not backwards compatible now you do get a um uh mvme header here here and here so there are three on the board you can also see that you've got a little fan but the fan also does help cool your mvmes now with the cooling at the top there is a eight millimeter heat pipe just up here which connects the main bulk of the um, heat sink up here with the extra one down the side now there's a few things down the side that it is touching one of them's there is a controller just down here that's controlling the uh, the pwm for the memory for example but there's just an, a massive massive amount of uh, surface area there because all of these little fins just massively increase the surface area and then thus that means extra cooling as well and i will talk to you about vrm temps <clears throat> in a moment and we have pummeled them as much as we possibly can do with this but i have nothing but good things to say you can see that you've got a little pci poster over here it lights up white it's probably the second thing that i don't really like on the board it feels a little bit out of place um, and i think it might have been nice if there was a little cover or something for it or it's somewhere less visible um but it's that's very much is just me just being a bit picky much like the rest of the board round the back is pretty much as crazy as they could have made it so all of the usbs round the back are usb 3.2 gen 2 <coughs> you've got uh the wi-fi here is uh wi-fi 6 uh you do get usb c down here gold plated audio headers down in this section um, and you do get a clear BIOS and also a Q flash up the top here, which is a bit like BIOS flashback. It's just a way of being able to flash your BIOS without even a CPU uh, from a USB. And this little vented area is just to let some um, air come out from your heat sink that is on the other side. And while we've got it here, I think it's worth just kind of zooming in to see how intricate these heat sinks are. And it's just like the old copper ones back in the day from like the old 775 days apart from these have been anodized coated and the technology is a little bit more kind of up market now and like i said this one does have that massive eight millimeter heat pipe in the corner so they they are really trying to look after you and your temperatures and make sure that everything is going to be covered okay so into the thick of the testing and i'm going to go straight in with the vrms because the vrms is uh, can be something that can actually differentiate between the boards but weirdly with the uh, three that i've got in the graph so i've tested for nda the uh, zenith 2 the creator and the trx extreme um weirdly they're all running the same uh, mosfets 
So they've got the same Infineon power stages on them. It's the controller and how they're wired that is slightly different between the two. But as I've shown you with the Aorus, it's got a dedicated 16 phase Infineon control, digital controller anyway. But weirdly, the, uh, the Aorus came out slightly warmer than the other two. And you think that's a bad thing, but even with it being pummeled with an overclock, the VRMs didn't go above 60 degrees. If you think back to like some of the older days, pulling less power, some of the VRMs would have been um, heating up to sort of like 80, 90, and then even sometimes 100 degrees. This just isn't. Uh, and there's only really in reality the difference between the two. Um, so we've got uh, sort of about 10 degrees really between the, the, the boards which again isn't a massive thing, they're all tested fairly, they're all tested in a room with the uh, same ambient temperature, they were tested in the same case because we actually put it in a proper case, so it's, it's basically to make it as fair as possible. But So they are slightly warmer, but it's really to a level when they're this cool, it doesn't particularly matter, a sausage. Uh, but it's, you know, we need to give you these numbers anyway. Then when it comes to uh, Cinebench, and I do need to stress that you can go to the OC3D website and look at the other board reviews if you want. You can go and have a look at the CPU reviews. There's other stuff that we've put all live at the same time. I'll put the links underneath for you and you can click through and you can go and look to your heart's content because there are many, many more graphs. The reviews are all like 20 plus pages each. So there's a lot more data over there. We just pick out the, um, the cream of the crop, you know, the interesting parts for us to talk about in the video. So with Cinebent, the, um, the Aorus did very well with this, both at stock and overclock. And one of the reasons why I wanted to draw attention to this is the Aorus technically isn't or wasn't part of the press release pack, uh, which also meant it didn't get the final reviewer's BIOS. So it didn't get the Agisa code for the final BIOS. And the, the creator and the ROG did get another version and but uh, Aorus didn't get the, the Agisa code for that. So essentially the BIOS that I was running on this was a couple of weeks old and the both of the other boards had been updated from that point. So the fact this was doing quite so well at this point was a little bit of a shock to me because if I'm honest, I wasn't expecting it to. So I did just want to draw attention to that and give Gigabyte Aorus a pat on the back for quite clearly putting a lot of time in to getting things refined. And I actually look forward to seeing how much better they can make this in the future, especially when they get that extra Agisa. Although I believe that Agisa code was just trying to make the boost and some memory compatibility slightly better. Um, but while we are talking about it, overclock was actually really simple and it was very similar across all three boards. And that was a fixed clock of 4.3 gigahertz across all the cores at 1.35 volts. You do need to go in and turn some of the power management stuff up to allow the CPU to gobble a little bit more power. But as in the CPU review, it's below 500 watts, which sounds like a lot. But when you consider that the 10980XE, admittedly it was a higher core speed, but that was pulling 660 watts from the wall. So I'm not sure, quite sure how AMD have managed to do it. Maybe it is the seven nanometer side of things, but essentially what they've done is they've got 24 cores running and pulling what I would say by their standards, especially compared so the second generation is that it's really not pulling as much power as I was expecting. And I don't think the board manufacturers were expecting it to be so low either. And that's why they've all gone with crazy VRMs at the top to make sure that everything wasn't getting hot and it doesn't really need it. But anyway, so Cinebench, it did very well. Blender, the MSI creator topped this graph uh, for the overclock and the Zenith went top with the uh, stock. Uh, Vegas, now Vegas is weird because Vegas actually, it does use a lot of cores, but it, it seems to favor clock speed a little bit, but it seemed to suit the uh, Aorus on this one. Um, uh, and if you, <laughs> if you have a look, it, it did very well. Uh, and then gaming, this is just to give you an idea. With the games, to be honest with you, we do it 
so that you get the data. But it, the, the hardcore rendering side of things with these boards are what most people are going to be interested in. The cooling, you know, the extra um, USBs and that sort of thing was probably going to be the bit that differentiates the boards and you're not necessarily going to worry about the gaming too much especially because in reality the biggest thing that's going to change between the boards is going to be what graphics card you put in and yes we've used the 2880 Ti 1080p to really stress it but this is really something that you would pull between CPUs more than motherboards and it's always going to be some kind of weird run tolerance um, and at the end of the day you know they've all done very very closely in reality so with the Aorus Extreme I'm obviously trying to film a lot of videos all on the same day to try and get stuff all out between uh, before NDA but in reality this board is the one that's put a smile on my face the most because it's not big and shouty and they've kept it kind of minimal the VRMs are absolutely spot on admittedly they they looked slightly warmer in the grass i have a funny feeling that might be some kind of switch inside of things because the heat sink is pretty much there and it's spot on so i think with a bias revision or two you're probably going to see those pw uh, the vrms come down in temperature a little bit layout's good looks great build quality is absolutely spot on and you can see with a lot of the graphs, it's top of the graphs. But don't forget, if you'd like to see more graphs, you can go to the OC3D website to have a look. But award-wise, for the Aorus Extreme, you're going to give it the ultimate award. And admittedly, I've not been able to test it with the 3970X yet, but I am hoping to in the not-too-distant future. I generally don't foresee any issues. I think long-term, the only thing that might change the board performance will be the BIOS but as long as their BIOS team don't rush things and stay on board and like focused at looking at benchmarks and stuff I think this has the uh, hallmarks of it being an, an amazing board for Gigabyte and I do think as well you can see a very marked change in their electrical design and their focus on bringing absolutely spot-end hardware, spot-on hardware, to the end user again. Uh, and I think it's a great thing to see. And I can honestly say I've not been this impressed with Aorus because obviously we had the X570 Extreme now, we've got the TRX40 Extreme and they've, they've kind of like refined it that little bit more. And I genuinely think they're putting more effort into their design and their products now than I have known them to in a long time. And I think there are certain other big brands that should be now sitting up, taking attention, and getting a little bit worried about it. And that's why I'm going to give this the OC3D Ultimate Award.